Oops, sorry there. You see, messaging is quite common these days. At any time, I can grab my smartphone and send a message to wherever in the world I want. I can even send an audio clip or a video of me making this video. Telecommunications have come to a high, especially the last decades with the use of the internet, which has become a part of our everyday lives. I know this sounds like whatever, this is the norm today. But before the internet, how was communication possible? And I don't mean like talking to someone else in person, but by distance. Today we will make a telecommunications rewind to take a glimpse of the world before internet, before fast messaging. For centuries, mailing was done by writing a letter by hand and giving it to a messenger so he can deliver it safely to the recipient. This messenger was either a human or a bird or a sheep. People were quite fine with slow communication because in reality there was no other way back then, so slow messaging was just messaging. This does not mean that this was it. For sure there were problems with snail mail. And sometimes, maybe most of the times, the speed of messaging was tragically slow. In 1825, an accomplished painter was making the portrait of the Marquise de Lafayette. A messenger on a horse gave him a letter which he had received from his father, telling him that his wife was gravely ill. So he immediately left the capital to return back home at Connecticut, only to find that his wife was not only dead, but she was already been buried. The devastated painter made a career-turning decision to improve mailing services. We're talking about Samuel Morse, the inventor of Morse code and the modern telegraph. Turning from an otherwise accomplished career as an artist, to become an inventor was huge. To give you an idea, this is one of his prime works, The Death of Hercules. In 1819, he also made the portrait of US President Monroe. Even to this day, this portrait decorates the interior of the White House. But he shifted away his focus from his art career and dedicated his life and efforts to improve the state of long-distance communication. This is an electric telegraph. It is a point-to-point -point text messaging system it uses coded pulses of electric current through wires over long distances, sending messages in a fraction of a second. This is the first electrical telecommunication system and a breakthrough as for the first time there was no need for physical transportation of a message. Its use is quite easy to adapt and the machine itself is less sophisticated compared to today's computers. As the operator pressed that button, the electric signal traveled through the wiring system ending to the receiver Another telegraph that used electromagnetic field created from the electric signal, making the telegraph buzz. The operator at the end of the line knows how to convert this otherwise electric signal gibberish to an actual message. Morse had received many patents from the US for his inventions, but the telegraph did not pop out of his mind one day. In fact, he was not even the first to think of this invention. Telegraphs were in experimental stages even before Morse was born. In 1753, Charles Marshall suggested in the Scots magazine an electrostatic telegraph using one wire for each letter of the alphabet. A message could be transmitted by connecting that wire terminals in turn to an electrostatic machine and observing the deflection of pith balls at the end. The idea was quite neat and fundamentally it was very close to what modern computers do. Press a button and the proper electric signal is transmitted to print the letter on your screen. Nonetheless, they were considered impractical and were never developed as a fully functioning system. The reason? It made a huge leap as a conception, more than technology could handle those days. Do not forget that at that time electricity was crude and undeveloped. In 1774, Georges-Louis Lesage realized an early electric telegraph. The telegraph had a separate wire for each of the 26 letters of the Latin alphabet, but its range was only between two rooms of his home. These ideas sound pretty familiar to what we are used today, but they weren't enough to fully develop as a functioning system because they lacked ingredients which were later developed, beginning with Alessandro Volta, who in 1800 invented the voltaic pile, hence the name, allowing for a continuous electric current to flow for experimentation. This became a source of low-voltage current that could be used to produce more distinct effects and which was far less limited than the momentary discharge of an electrostatic machine. 
Back then, there were no batteries except from the Leiden jars, which were the only known man-made sources of electricity. In 1825, something incredible happened that could determine future telegraphs and, as a result, today's telecommunications. William Sturgeon invented the electromagnet with a single winding of an insulated wire of a varnished iron, which increased the magnetic force. We are now closer to gather the recipe for a telegraph. Nine years later, in 1835, Joseph Henry and Edward Dave invented the critical electrical relay. This leads us to the first sorting systems. Many inventors created different versions of the telegraph, like Baron Schilling from Kansad, who created the keyboard of the 16 black and white keys. Gauss and Weber used galvanometers to transmit messages. Carl Seinhel, who built a telegraph network in Munich, and the telegraph of Cook and Whitstone, who developed a needle-based telegraph, all had the same fundamental flaw. Their inventions were indicating letters. Now, don't get twisted because all those got a patent and were considered as functional telegraphs. But the use of separate key for each letter was not feasible. It was time-consuming, expensive and, above all, not worth the risk, as investors claim. Let's see a simple example to send the word hello on a multi-key telegraph to see how time-consuming it is. We will need to point the indicator at H, send an electric signal, then go back to zero, then indicate E and send the electric signal, then back to zero again and then indicate L, send it twice and then do the same for the O letter. At the end of the line, the other operator would first hear eight bleeps for H, as H is the eighth letter of the alphabet, then five bleeps for E, then 12 bleeps for L, another 12 bleeps for L, and finally 15 bleeps for O. This is a total of 52 bleeps for a single word. Hello. Cook's and Whitstone's telegraph was not even indicating all Latin letters. By the time Morse was developing his version of the telegraph, the fastest and only way to send a message from the East Coast to West Coast of the United States and vice versa was the Pony Express. Daring men on horses were traveling tirelessly across the continent from St. Joseph, nearby Kansas, to Hooks and Craigs through the desert and Indian settlements, especially at a time when relations with the newly established USA were not good with the Native Americans, across the Independence Rock and Granger passing by the Rocky Mountains and Salt Lake City to as many as possible stations, all the way to Carson and finally Sacramento, San Francisco. Each crossing was just 10 days, and riders like Buffalo Bill were making a relay race every day of 3,100 kilometers. To the European audience, this is equal to a trip from London all the way down to Athens, Greece, on a horse. The Pony Express was so dangerous that even the recruitment poster was saying, wanted. Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, must be expert riders, willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred. After all those patents and all those considered as functional telegraphs, what made the telegraph of Samuel Morse so special? What Morse did was making the telegraph easy at all aspects. Easy to use, easy to construct and install, and above all, cheaper to make. How did he do it? Well, basically he installed one tool that was not even part of the actual machine, the Morse code. Up to that day, there was no coding, and Morse made one of dots and dashes, which eventually replaced all letter keys, either 5 or 20 or 36, with just one. The international Morse code enlists 26 characters of the Latin alphabet from A to Z, the Arabic numerals, some punctuation marks and some other non-English letters. There is no distinction, though, between lower and uppercase letters. Just one key. You see, it was easier for operators to learn the code rather than build a sophisticated machine which requires a bunch of wires. But even this revolutionary design faced initial criticism. The reaction of Senator Smith of Indiana after a demonstration of the telegraph by Morse for members of Congress in 1842 as reported in the 1915 book A History of Travel in America, I watched his countenance closely to see if he was not deranged, and I was assured by other senators after we left the room that they had no confidence in it. When Congress was asked to provide funds for a telegraph line between Baltimore and New York City, the Congressional Globe reported that Senator George McDuffie opposed it, explaining that he asked what was this telegraph to do? Would it transmit letters and newspapers? 
Under what power in the Constitution did Senators propose to erect this telegraph? And besides, the telegraph might be made very mischievous and secret information after communicated to the prejudice of merchants. When Morse offered to sell his telegraph to the US government for $100,000, the Postmaster General rejected the offer. James Wright explained the rejection in his 1879 book, The Telegraph in America. The operation of the telegraph between Washington and Baltimore had not satisfied him that under any rate of postage that could be adopted, its revenues could be made equal to its expenditures. After all the criticism and difficulties Morse faced even from senators, he eventually gained the trust and convinced everyone in the White House why his telegraph was so special. Even if I won't replicate his arguments, I will hand over a simple table with numbers. When a telegraph was able to send a message instantly, a letter sent by pass from London took 12 days to reach New York, 19 days to reach Istanbul, a whole month to reach the west coast of India, and an additional two weeks to reach the east coast at Calcutta, almost two months to reach Shanghai, China, and over 10 weeks to reach Sydney, Australia. Long story short, and the first telegram was sent by Morse himself on January 11, 1838, at Speedwell Ironworks in Morristown, New Jersey. Although his first famous message was sent six years later in 1844 saying what hath God wrought, which means what has God done. This message was sent across 71 kilometers of distance from the capital of Washington to the old Mount Clare depot at Baltimore. From that point on, the Morsky and Sounder system was installed in every US rail station. In just two decades after the first official demonstration of the telegraph, it connected the east coast of the continent with the west coast by 24th of October 1861, eventually bringing the end to the Pony Express just two days later after a merely 18-month period of operation. When the first transatlantic cable was built from England to the United States and President Buchanan and Queen Victoria exchanged messages in 1858, a writer for the Times of London raved, Tomorrow, the hearts of the civilized world will beat in single pulse, and from that time forth, forevermore, the continental divisions of the Earth will, in a measure, lose those conditions of time and distance which now mark their relations. War is not ever absent from human history, and has brought death and hunger and tyranny. The need to win and eventually end a war was essential. So many have thought that the telegraph would be a great asset when conducting a war. And right they were. The ability to send telegrams brought advantages to those conducting a war. Sometimes they were sent via cable, others by light dots and dashes represented as short and long flashes. But all times the messages were encrypted so the enemy would not be able to translate them if intercepted. The first widespread conflict to use telegraphs was the Crimean War, and the first to be documented extensively as a result. Apart from military officers who were using telegraphs on a daily basis, journalists did so as well. News from war correspondents kept the public of the nations informed of the day-to-day -day events in a way that has not been possible in any previous war. The telegraph was so strong that daily news and reports energized the public opinion and brought down the government of the UK. Undeniably, war was the cause to develop new telegraphic lines. Just six months after the American Civil War had started, the US military telegraph had laid 300 miles of wire, and by the end of the war, they had laid over 15,000 miles of wire, 8,000 of those for military use and only 5,000 miles for commercial use. The telegraph was also used in World War I and World War II. This time, the telegraph was rather a type of war instead of information. Known as the Cable Wars, English and German cables were cut from each other to minimize communication and route for espionage. In America, the end of the telegraph era can be associated with the fall of the Western Union Telegraph Company. Western Union was the leading telegraph provider for America and was seen as the best competition for the National Bell Telephone Company. These two companies were both invested in telegraph and telephone company. Western Union made a huge mistake, though. They allowed Bell to gain the advantage over telephone technologies because they did not foresee the surpass of telephone over the, at the time, dominant telegraph. Although telegraphy is not active anymore as a means of communication, the telegraph and the Morse code are still in use in military, intelligence and aviation. 
Even its limited use nowadays, this invention was the cornerstone of communications, as the telegraph in reality paved the way for radio communications, followed by television, bringing us to today, the Internet. The telegraph is a perfect example that a great idea doesn't have to be a complicated one. What we have here today for granted is the fruit of an experimental marathon of researchers who wanted to communicate fast and easy. Thank you for being here today, and as always, 